Hello, my name is Sam Brockway. I am a concurrent master's student in the School of Marine Affairs in the Evans School of Public Affairs. And it is with great honor that I introduce the keynote speaker for the first ever Science and Policy Summit, Professor Emeritus Edward Miles. Professor Miles is a Virginia and Prentice Bladell Professor in Marine and Public Affairs and a senior fellow of the Joint Institute for the Study of Atmosphere and Oceans. He received a PhD from the University of Denver in International Relations and Comparative Politics. Prefer Professor Miles has been a member or chairman of a staggering number of com committees, and a, just a sample of these include um, Chairman of Ocean Policy Committee uh, and National Academy of Sciences National Research Council, member of the Executive Board of the Law of the Sea Institute, chairman, and chairman of the Legal and Institutional Task Group on the Implications of Disposal of High-Level Radioactive Waste into the Seabed. Chairman of the Advisory Committee on International Programs uh, of the National Science Foundation. Member of the Advisory Committee for Social, Behavioral, and Economic Sciences of the National Science Foundation. He's also served as a consultant to the, to the United Nations Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of uh, UN, uh, UNSECO and the South Pacific Forum Fisheries Agency. He is appointed lead author, author for the Marine Policy of Oceans and Large Lakes of the Intergovernment, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and has also, also authored many studies uh, on international organizations, international science, and technolo technology policy and marine policy and ocean management. Within the University of Washington, he has served as the director of the School of Marine Affairs, the chairman of the University Committee on Interdisciplinary Research and Graduate Education, a member of the University's Steering Committee on Global Change and Chairman of the President's Task Force on Environmental Education. Professor Miles proposed and created the Climate Impacts Group, which, which brought together scientists, social scientists, and legal scholars at the University of Washington to analyze the effects of climate variability throughout the Columbia River Basin. Some of Professor Miles' accolades include membership to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, fellow of, of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, fellow of the Amer American Academy of Arts and Sciences and member of the Board of Directors for the Union of Concerned Scientists. In today's assemblage of experts on pivotal issues at the science and policy interface, Ed's breadth of experience and knowledge of topics at the international scale provides an invaluable insight. Thank you, Ed, for serving as the keynote speaker for the inaugural GPSS Science and Policy Summit. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. I am very proud of what you're, you've been doing. Um, let's see. No? Okay. So, oh, you can't see that very well. What I'm going to do in the time available um, is to focus on space-time scale effects, as I call it, using four case studies, only one of which I will have the time to develop in some detail, that's the subseabed disposal of high-level radioactive waste. But I'm also going to talk about uh, issues surrounding how the climate change issue was framed uh, at the beginning, 1981 to 1987. And then I'm going to contrast those two with, and those two are, of course, at the global scale, though uh, subseabed is also regional, international. And I'm going to descend to uh, re regional within states, so subnational efforts, and contrast w what we learned uh, at both levels and what lessons. Uh, might be most appropriate. So, um, I already told you that. So, uh, 
why uh, am I focusing on um, time scale now? Um, for more than 46 years, I've worked at the interface of natural sciences, social sciences, and law on problems with respect to how we manage the global commons. And uh, I worked most substantively on outer space, oceans, climate, uh, and I also worked on control of nuclear proliferation and radioactive waste disposal. And what I found out over this time is that if the time scale of the problem is years to decades, then potential solutions are easier to envision. But that severe difficulties emerge if the problem is global and if the time scales range from decades to millennia. Uh, and their solutions are possible only on time scales of decades to centuries. The principal issue uh, behind why these e efforts usually fail can be defined in terms of the rate at which the future is discounted in benefit cost analytics and the dynamics of politics that emerge around those efforts. So I began working on climate change in 1989, but I didn't expect the international system to respond effectively for a number of reasons, and I haven't been disappointed in that expectation. Uh, so why, why is this so difficult? There are a number of answers to that question. Most environmental problems on any time scale are prisoner's dilemma situations in which participants can achieve mutual gains from cooperation, but in the absence of externally imposed coercion incentives or loyalties, the biggest incentive is to defect rather than cooperate. And by defection, I mean the desire to have someone else bear the cost of providing the collective good. And the larger the group, the harder it is to achieve sufficient cooperation to solve the problem. The international system then, which is heavily constrained by issues of national sovereignty and divisive state interests, tends to respond effectively under only two conditions disaster or consensus that disaster is imminent in the short run. So the short time horizons of most governments, especially the democratically elected ones, is to heavily discount the future and they are unwilling to face up the problems of long time scale. The EU in this respect is a very important anomaly, and we'll come back to that. But in the present case, that means this unwillingness to face up the problems of long time scale means creating severe problems of intergenerational inequity which are usually shoved under the rug. And in the present case, with respect to climate change and its effects, that means pushing these problems on your shoulders, and particularly those of your present or future children. So why is the international system a problem? It's a complex structure of three major levels, the national, the regional, international, and the global. The players are states, intergovernmental organizations, and non-governmental organizations, plus multinational corporations, 
many with cash reserves in excess of most governments. Sometimes individuals become actors on particular issues. One of those recently left the land of the living, but the national level drives the whole show. And the dynamics of representational and bureaucratic politics not only drive the national level, but they're refracted at the regional, international, and global levels as well. So the result is that conflicts of interest between bureaucrats and politicians at the national level tend to surface at global lawmaking conferences, even when they have nothing to do with the problem at hand. So what are the consequences of this? You ought to be very careful about taking any issue to this kind of a system and think through the likely consequences because it's a Pandora's box. And you cannot guarantee that the outcome will satisfy the interests of players who initiated the process. And you can also cannot guarantee that what is implemented is what was decided. So governments seek collective action at the global level only when they can't achieve what is desired anywhere else at less cost. There's considerable political indeterminacy at the global level because the options differentially affect conflicts of interest and the distribution of benefits versus costs. And those characteristics don't match problems in the natural world. In the natural world, problems, environmental problems, usually caused by human activities, always come as integrated systems, not neatly carved up into academic disciplines, nor in bureaucratic boxes in in which governments organize themselves. And this therefore leads to fragmented authority and lots of conflicts. And the body of national and international legislation which exists contains significant gaps and discrepancies because different pieces were enacted by different people at different times for different purposes. So it's not a surprise that we humans don't do so well with environmental problems of long time scale. So let's look at some seabed disposal of high level radioactive waste. The timeline for this issue is 1976 to 1987, and my involvement occurred from 1981 to 87. The concept is very interesting that the deep sea floor beyond national jurisdiction is perhaps the most stable geological formation on Earth. And we're talking here about the mid-plate, mid-gyre regions. And that this should be prime target for assessing the feasibility of burial of high-level waste. The idea was the brainchild of a close friend, now dead, um, Charlie Hollister, a geologist at Woods Hole. Uh, and he, uh, together with some others and contacts in the Department of Energy, uh, theorized about how this would work and, and whether it was worth testing. So, uh, okay, if the uh, location is correctly defined, what would you do about high level waste? Well, you have two choices. You have the liquid that's the result of reprocessing, chemical reprocessing, to produce weapons quality plutonium. And you also have the spent fuel. So at first, the focus was on the um, liquid resulting from reprocessing of spent fuel. 
Nobody then uh, recognized that this was a major asset for closing the back end of the nuclear fuel cycle, putting strong brakes on proliferation. And that was my contribution to the process because I came out of the international politics route, not the science route originally. And uh, <clears throat> so the waste form then, you would turn the liquid into a borosilicate, a glass, um, and uh, you would define multiple barriers. The waste form, which I just told you, you'd put a canister around it and a nose cone and fins, it would then become a large projectile. Uh, that was the first barrier. And the sediments were the ultimate barrier. They must be more than a million years old, characterized by high sorption characteristics and continuously predictable sediment properties. The pore water in the sediments also had to be more than a million years old. The canister itself was made of Tycode, Tycode 12. Steel doesn't do well in seawater. And, uh, um, <clears throat> but this would last only somewhere between 500 and 1,000 years. And we needed it to last more than uh, 10,000 years, if possible. So the, the issue was discussed in the US government. The US discussed it with the Europeans. And the result was that 10 countries and the then EEC Commission uh, combined national and internationally teams. And Sandia Labs was the manager at both the national and the international level with oversight uh, by the Department of Energy in the US case and the seabed working group at the Nuclear Energy Agency of OECD, the uh, Advanced Industrial Countries International Organization. And three questions were posed to the team initially. <clears throat> The first was, are there locations in the oceans which have geologic stability and barrier properties suitable for disposal of high-level waste? The second was, is it possible to implant waste-filled canisters in sediments? And if so, with what effects on barrier properties of cont the containment system? And the third question was, what are radiological consequences of seabed burial? I thought those were eminently sensible <coughs> questions and stuff governments ought to know. So <clears throat> complementary national international task groups were created in a systems framework. Um, there was one focused on system analysis, one on site selection, biology, physical oceanography, sediment barrier, near field studies, engineering studies. And in 1982, uh, that's why I was asked to join the group in 1981, they made the formal decision to add a legal and institutional task group. I became the chair of that to perform four functions to assess the legal and institutional problems likely to affect some seabed disposal, to draft a scenario for implementation, to review applicable international laws and treaties, and to keep under review developments in the law of the sea negotiations that may affect the option. So on that latter one uh, in particular, I would advise the uh, seabed working group, which was the International Executive Committee of the whole effort. And here you see the concept um, up there, 
the source of the plant and the treatment, um, uh, turning the liquid into borosilicate. And here you have the transport to ports by road, barge, or rail. And then from the port um, onto ships, and you have uh, several options. This one is you, you just you position the ship in the middle of one of these uh, plates where you have previously determined the sediment of the right quality, and you just you can even just push it off the fan tail. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Uh, and the, in the theoretical work done, it was assumed that the, the um, mass of the canister um, would drive it into the sediment uh, to a depth of 30 meters, and that that was really all you needed. Um, when the experiment was done, the answer was 70 meters. The models were significantly off, but in the right direction. So, at one very excite, intellectually exciting uh, moment in the work, it was not known at this time uh, how heat moved in sediment at depth. And uh, you have two possibilities. Either it moves by convection or it moves by conduction. If the answer would have been it moved by convection, then we would have been out of business because the barriers would fail. So uh, it turns out that heat in sediments moves by conduction, not convection. So then you have to worry about what heat does to the canister uh, because you have two problems when you initially want to dispose of the canister. There's a, ra a thermal radiation problem from the isotopes that are encased within it. And there is a, um, a, radio, a, radio, a, a fully radioactive uh, response. And so uh, you want to know uh, what heat does to the movement of the canister. And to the, once you put the canister down there, to the pore water in the sediments, the, the, the pore water is the water that is encased within those sediments uh, sometimes millions of years ago. Um, and you want to look for the, both the near field and the far field effects. It was really another exciting time when it was discovered that pore water advection, the rate at which it moved, was less than a millimeter a year. And uh, therefore, you could calculate that it would take leaching of a single canister at depth about 5,000 years. Um, so that simple disposal of a canister with nose, cone, and fins, the mass of the canister being uh, 3,000 kilograms, through the correct positioning of the ship and the penetration to 70 meters depth with a terminal velocity of 40 meters per second, there was one issue that needed to be settled and how quickly does the hole close? And it turns out that the hole created by penetration closes within seconds, 
because of the nature of the clays. And uh, the small plume of water on the back of the uh, canister created by the geometry of the fins, um, that disappears, it, it evaporates um, within a very short time as a result of the intense thermal radiation of the canister. So this was a neat idea. And the radiological assessment showed there would be no repository, no releases from the repository for about 10,000 years. And the maximum dose to individuals would occur about 100,000 years after emplacement. And the dose was equal to 10 to the minus 9 sieverts a year which is equal to uh, a million times less than natural background radiation. So uh, this is a figure that was shown uh, by Travis et al. in a paper. And the Sandia guys um, modified it to add their data. Now, the x's show where sites have been regulated. So everything above this line is the result of regulation. Within this section, you have both regulation and non-regulation depending upon the activity and its result. Everything south of this uh, line is not regulated. And then this is where uh, sub-seabed fell. This point is if you use the best estimate data, and this point is if you use the least favorable data. So this is quite far from the threshold. And this is the Sandia Labs radiological assessment, uh, risk assessment rather. This is the line of regulation. This is the, um, <clears throat> there is no official de minimis level defined, but this is the most popular one. And so this is if you use, this curve is if you use the least favorable subseabed data. Um, this one is if you use the, the best estimate. And these are um, the, mo the most favorable results from within the Sandia Labs data. So um, now we're going to shift from the science to the policy. And the emergence of those results, you would have thought that people very much involved in this, would be pleased to know that this alternative met all the tests, would be an acceptable alternative to Yucca Mountain if Yucca Mountain did not work out, ha ha, and uh, that business would have gone on. But that's not what happened. And pay particular attention to what happens here. This triggered a game at three levels. 
the regional international level within the OEC, the Nuclear Energy Agency, OECD. Uh, and that game was the SSD coalition uh, versus the anti-SSD coalition, who were also members of OECD. And that fight related far more to internal conflicts in Spain with respect to the Basque separatist movement. And what on earth, you might say, does this have to do with disposal of high-level radioactive waste? The Basques argued that uh, this stuff would be disposed of, one of the test sites, uh, about 400 miles off the coast of Spain. And they depended primarily on tourism and fisheries to make a living and this would compromise their life. Well, Felipe Gonzalez, who was the prime minister, very smart, able guy, he didn't have a dog in the, in the fight with respect to some seabed, but he sure had one in the other fight, so sacrificing some seabed was an acceptable outcome to him. And that's what he ordered his folks to do. Um, so the, uh, the global context involved the consultative parties to the London Dumping Convention, and um, this is much larger, being global, uh, and most of those states um, didn't have a dog in the fight. But they could be mobilized by those who did. And uh, the Spaniards went uh, to great lengths to mobilize an overwhelming anti-subseabed um, um, coalition. And, and I was handed a new job at that point. Uh, my new job was to keep the program alive through these dangerous waters. Uh, we held two meetings in 83, 84, uh, and the results, uh, these difficult meetings, there were two, two results. The first was that we agreed that the London Dumping Convention was the appropriate forum to assess the question of high level rate. The, using the uh, subseabed to dispose of high-level radioactive waste. Um, and we also agreed that no such disposal should take place unless and until it's proven to be technically feasible and environmentally acceptable, including a determination that such waste can be effectively isolated from the marine environment and the regulatory mechanism is elaborated under the London Dumping Convention. But if you watched only the global level of conflict, you'd have an inadequate view of the dynamics. And the internal conflict at the national level proved to be far more deadly. Uh, there were three of those operating simultaneously, but they sort of became connected. One was the Spain problem. The second was in Denmark, uh, the gentle Danes. But at this point, Greenpeace was heavily supported by the environment minister and the parliamentary majority in Denmark uh, was heavily supportive of Greenpeace. And their objective was to force a vote in the London Dumping Convention because the anti-dumping coalition was in ascendancy. This triggered a huge fight in the United Kingdom. 
And their issue was that if the Danes were to do this, then the United Kingdom should, and there was heavy pressure on the Iron Lady, uh, Mar Margaret Thatcher, to withdraw from the London Dumping Convention and denounce it, and that could lead to its disintegration. Uh, and they, the Brits didn't want this because it turned out to be quite useful in regulating international uh, uh, pollution via um, river transport. So the outcome was a draw to avoid damaging the London Dumping Convention. The idea was just leave things as they are. They don't need any more than the two points which were negotiated. And uh, the, 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 there's a long story, but to make it short, the way we, in fact, achieved that uh, solution was uh, because there was a, a student there, a former student from Norway, who I helped to get into the Evans School, and he happened now to be a senior member of the Norwegian delegation at that meeting. And the Secretary General of the IMO gave a cocktail party, and we got in a corner and we talked, and, uh, and we agreed that this should be the outcome. And I said, can you sell that to your guys? And he said, yeah. Can you sell it to yours? I said, yeah. Uh, uh, so let's do it. And in fact, we did. So former students are really useful. <laughs> but the most deadly conflict was in the United States um, between DOE on the one hand, but a particular part of DOE, International Affairs, aligned with the Department of Defense, particularly the Navy, versus other US agencies like NOAA and EPA who wanted to kill the program. The Department of State, representing the United States at many of these things, was in effect neutral on the issue. The Office of Civilian Radioactive Waste Management of DOE was supportive of the of subseabed as an alternate path. Um, and in the event that the principal path, which was Yucca Mountain, was blocked. And um, then there was a wild card. And the wild card was the publication of our results, which I've just shown you. So this, these terrific results had very serious political consequences. Uh, and those consequences uh, were caused by the Nevada delegation, in which Senator Johnston, I believe was his name, uh, he uh, went uh, to the Department of Energy and he said, well, if this stuff is so great, why are you all putting it in our backyard? So uh, we became an embarrassment to the program because the science we had done was too good. And uh, this coalition emerged between the nuclear power industry and the bureaucrats in the Office of Civilian Radioactive Waste Management uh, to kill us. Um, so, what was the final outcome? The, uh, their objective was to uh, turn off all funds so that the subseabed disposal team led by Sandia could, could not operate. 
uh, and industry would stop any possibility of using funds in super fund coffers. And uh, there was congressional support for the SSD option, but they authorized it without appropriating. So uh, death loomed imminent. Uh, and at that point, I happened to have uh, connections in the National Security Council in the White House, which is not something that happens very frequently as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and I decided to use it. And so I wrote a paper um, outlining what I thought were the national security implications of this thing. And I sent it to the national security uh, advisor to the president, uh, who was Bush one in this period. And they agreed with me. And so there was a coalition between um, the NSC, the uh, policy planning staff at the State Department, and the US ambassador to the UN, who, turned, who happened to be Tom Pickering, a highly knowledgeable uh, individual on proliferation and other problems. And uh, the NSC instructed the Secretary of Energy to stop active opposition, and, but the industry refused to permit the use of funds to continue this program, uh, and they went on to spend $20 billion on Yucca Mountain. While we, the scientists in our group, kept saying to ourselves, this is not licensable by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission because the geology is too complex and there's too much water in here. Well, the NRC did rule that not too long ago after the expenditure of $20 billion. Now, I fail to see how this is a sensible process. And uh, it just happens to be the uh, way in which the business is done. So let's look at, it will be much shorter, the um, FCC process, climate change. Um, the issue was, on the international agenda, you know what the Keeling curve is, I, I hope. Um, and it was Roger Ravel and Charles Keeling, but first the Ravel Suez paper, which appeared in 1957, uh, concerning ocean atmosphere CO2 exchange. And Charles Keeling at Scripps um, being tasked with uh, coming up, making these measurements of atmospheric concentrations from 1958, and that's that famous curve. So when did the issue really come on to the international political agenda? That was 1985, and it's the scientists who put it there in two meetings, uh, and they worked very effectively to build what is called an epistemic community, a coalition of scientific, governmental, and NGO experts framing the problem and pushing for action. And at this time, out of pure serendipity, the ozone hole over the Antarctic was discovered and a very successful effort was launched um, via the Montreal Protocol. And as a result of that, the ozone approach became the template for the FCCC. That was a serious mistake. Uh, in addition, the summers of 1988 and 1989 uh, were quite intense, very hot, and Jim Hansen, uh, Goddard, 
um, made his famous statement to the Congress, global warming is here. And the uh, first non-governmental, governmental, governmental uh, international conference was convened by the prime ministers of Canada and Norway, who emerged as the first international political entrepreneurs. And a conference was held in Toronto that combined scientists, policymakers, and NGOs. In 1988, Bush won, found things moving to regulation too quickly. And the U.S. sought to slow this down by pushing for the creation of the IPCC as a mechanism for developing periodic consensus on scientific evaluations. Uh, and uh, so the IPCC in U.S. aim was to slow down any attempt at regulating the problem. Uh, it didn't turn out that way, but that's why it was done. Um, and this began, 1988, the problem uh, definition phase officially of, of the, the problem. Uh, at that time, there were problems in the U.S. economy, and both the Secretary of the Treasury, I can't remember who it was, and the Deputy Secretary, um, a former friend the, who died young, uh, uh, Dick Garman, um, used the White House Domestic Policy Council to assume a coordinating role on this and to shut the EPA out of the process. Uh, and um, this move uh, got the support of the Department of Energy, the Department of Interior, Department of Commerce, OMB, and the Council on Economic Advisors to the President. But that was only in the United States. In the UK, uh, when she got to hear about this, uh, Mrs. Thatcher, in 1989, convened a one-day cabinet-level briefing on the global climate change problem. And the Brits have really good scientists on this issue. And uh, she allowed not only the UK scientists, uh, but she, under their advice, invited some US scientists. Um, and this uh, was a very interesting moment. She thought that this was a really serious issue. Why? So, certainly, Bush one had a different thought that it represented real trouble to a very important groups in his coalition with whom he happened to be very closely associated. Mrs. Thatcher, on the other hand, had a background in industrial chemistry. So she could understand immediately the seriousness of this problem. And she arranged for the cabinet to be briefed. And her rules were very strict. They could ask no questions. Only she would ask the questions. And she interrogated this group of scientists for an entire day, eight hours. And at the end, she said, you convinced me. And she launched on a very powerful um, effort to make the, e e the then EEC into a united group on the issue, which they still are, and very powerful. And it was an extraordinary lesson in the difference that leadership makes on an issue like this. 
So you have one side catalyzing a very broad forward-looking strategy. On the other side, the group not wanting anything to happen. So um, I'll just slip to the uh, subnational level and wind up. Uh, during my time at the IPCC, which was for the second assessment in 1994, I was very impressed with the process, but I wasn't very much impressed with what we could say at the time. The data points for the models were 500 kilometers apart. And no decision maker that I ever knew would make policy on the basis of what we were putting out. And it seemed to me that uh, the effort Yes, on the global level for the big picture, but if you really wanted policy, you had to focus on the regional scale. And that's why I created the uh, Climate Impacts Group. And so th this was the way it was conceived at the time in terms of a triangle with uh, the climate problem, the uh, uh, socioeconomic effects and uh, the impacts on natural resources. And at that time, we did these uh, vertical assessments moving from climate dynamics to impacts on natural systems to impacts on human systems and human response capabilities. But we did this in a very different context a very close relationship with a large number of stakeholders to the extent that the uh, concept for the, um, uh, the tool uh, was considerably um, embellished. Uh, so we, the group was linked to the global research com community the triangle that I showed you remained focused on the Pacific Northwest, and the work uh, was very closely related to the interests of the resource managers of the region. So we held a workshop in 2001 for very high-level policymakers to explain to them what we had found out about the, impact, the likely impacts of climate change on water resources in the Pacific Northwest. All of us in the West live in snowmelt-driven systems, and we all, we all have the same set of vulnerabilities, some more than others. Um, and so we wanted to get this discussion going in the regulatory and managerial community, and we want, wanted those to, to, to take this information into account in making uh, their, their uh, decisions. So um, at the end of this meeting, the couple of the high-level guys came over to me and, and said, you know, don't say climate change. Say drought. And take your show to Washington, D.C., and give it to the Congress, because we don't control our own agenda, and we're not getting anything out of Washington. So we did that, and we held a briefing in the Capitol building, neutral ground. We gave them a nice lunch, and they said, in a kind of Alphonse Gaston uh, move, we are not the, uh, we don't make those decisions ourselves either. So what you need to do is go back home and talk your people into it, then we'll blah, 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 blah. 
So it was pretty clear. But the, the, the way that the incident that showed a way forward was in that same uh, close advice session, uh, he, the individual said, and put your data up on the web so our guys can play with it. And clearly, it seemed to me this was an important issue of trust that he was telling me about here. And so we did this. And uh, on the left, this is the Pacific Northwest hydro system. This is a set of data that we prepared for building scenarios where um, it's, uh, we removed the hydrologic model bias to produce climate change scenarios that can be substituted for the historical stream flow time series that's used in water resources planning. planning. And for, we work very closely with two stakeholders, Northwest Power Planning Council and Idaho Department of Water Resources to do this. And it has been a huge success. Uh, the other successful story is King County. Um, they developed a concept for a major regional conference, which was held in a football stadium. Uh, first time I ever discussed science in a football stadium. Uh, almost 700 people showed up for this. Uh, we looked at seven sectors, and uh, this uh, was the brainchild of Ron Sims, and so we have a repetition of the leadership, the quality of leadership being a really critical variable in, in the use of science. Uh, and his objective was to transform the way in which local government at county scale viewed the climate change set of issues, focusing on adaptation as a critical problem that required a detailed agenda and an explicit suite of policies. He was stepping out way in front of uh, the, not only the public, but his own staff at that point. But um, he then had us work together with his staff. The, he, the staff was first rate. And the two groups, our group and theirs, Got, to, got together very effectively and worked very intensively to produce this stuff for the workshop. And then he told his staff to take our projections to 2050 and work back from there across a range of sectors and elaborate policies that would make sense. Uh, this requires an extraordinary degree, not only of leadership, but of trust. Uh, and then he thought this worked so well that we ought to write it up. And we ought to come up with uh, a handbook um, so that others could have the same experience. So we did that jointly with King County, and that too was an enormous success. So um, to sum up, effectively bridging the gap between science and policy requires making the science useful to and usable by decision makers. There's, there must be sustained interaction between the scientists and the stakeholders. That's the only way the trust develops. And you have to provide tools to help them empty their inboxes. 
Um, so I'll stop here, working with the uh, sub-national level has been uh, very instructive and we see ways to have science effectively be an input into making decisions, working at the national and global levels. That's another story altogether. Thank you. Uh, please uh, join me in thanking Dr. Miles one more time for uh, closing out this summit. I also, on behalf of GPSS, want to thank everyone who's attended throughout the day. Um, you're the ones who we did this for, and I, at least seeing people from across the campus, I can say that I consider this a success. And uh, once again, thank you. And with that, this ends the inaugural GPSS Science and Policy Summit. Have a good evening.